and uh, today I am sitting in the state of Mr. Vikas. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> And I have requested him umpteen number of times. <laughs> he must come back uh, to this great uh, place. Undoubtedly, Bihar is a very, very energetic place. No doubt about it, sir. But, sir, it, interestingly, now I'm also a Himachali. I've got houses in Himachal also now. <laughs> oh, great. We have great bondage there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's a beautiful state, sir. Beautiful state. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think... Uh, uh, Professor uh, Sunny may uh, may have we may have to de debate with the Professor Sunny as to whether really uh, Himachal is God's own country with God's own people or is it Kerala which is really <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately sir I didn't visit Himachal so far. <laughs> oh welcome welcome you have two offers now today. <laughs> But the uh, Vice Chancellor Nishida, right? she is a close friend of me. <laughs> uh, Vice Chancellor? Uh, Nishida. Uh, her husband is also a Vice Chancellor, Paranjal Singh Jaiswar. Oh, okay, okay. Husband is in Chandigarh and wife is in Shimla. <laughs> How are you, brother Patak? I'm fine, sir, keeping well, sir, at Gwalior. <laughs> Shant, nice meeting you after a very, very long time. Very long time, sir. Very long time. <laughs> very, very sweet of you to have sent that uh, wonderful message and uh, really looking forward to catching up uh, for all the lost years. Great bondage we have, great fond uh, memories. And Prakat, when you, you are in uh, Delhi. That's right. Uh, Siddharth and Prakat, you, are you both in Sri Ram? Are you in Delhi? Both of uh, you? So, so, so I'm practicing in Delhi, but this COVID has taken me to Kerala. Uh, ever since uh, the, the lockdown good. started, I'm here. Uh, So good evening, everybody. Um, today we have assembled again for yet another amazing session. Uh, without any further ado, I would request uh, our uh, Executive Council, uh, Executive Committee member, Mr. Shriram Parakat, who is also an alumna, alumna of Nual Skochi, to introduce everybody who is part of the session today and uh, take the mic forward. Welcome, Shriram. Thank you, Siddharth. Uh, in fact, it's an absolute honor to have an erudite and learned panel with us, uh, like, the, like the one we have today. Mm, I just take this opportunity to shed some light on the numerous remarkable achievements by our panelists, so that you know we can familiarize uh, the audience with the depth of their knowledge and the experience of the panel in each field. Let me start with Honorable Justice Sanjay Karol. His lordship, after pursuing his graduation in history from the Government College Shimla, obtained his degree in law from the Himachal Pradesh University. Finally, in the year 1986, he enrolled as an advocate. Since then, he has practiced in various courts, including the Supreme Court of India, in areas encompassing constitutional, taxation, corporate, criminal, and civil matters. In fact, his lordship appeared as a counsel in the landmark interstate water dispute project before the Honorable Supreme Court of India. Having served as the, as the Advocate General of Himachal Pradesh from 98 to 2003, his Lordship was designated as a Senior Advocate in the year 1999. Post that, he remained on the Senior Panel of the Central Government at the Supreme Court of India. Later on, his Lordship became the Chairman of the Himachal Pradesh High Court Legal Service Committee and discharged his statutory duties as its Executive Chairman. And a he's also a member of the Board of Governors in the Himachal Pradesh Judicial Academy. After his stint as Acting Chief Justice of Himachal Pradesh High Court, his Lordship was appointed as the Chief Justice of the High Court of Tripura in 2018. In addition to being the Chief Justice of Tripura High Court, he also took upon the duties of the Patron-in-Chief of the Tripura State Legal Service Authority and the Chairman of the Tripura Judicial Academy. Finally, in 2019, his Lordship became the Chief Justice of Patna High Court, and he continues to serve this office till date. 
As a Chief Justice, his Lordship has given several judgments of significance. Recently, in 2020, April, his Lordship, through his judgment, has asked the state government to appraise the Patna High Court if there was any dedicated toll-free number to specifically deal with the problems of orphanages, old age homes, center for disabled persons, etc. in the lockdown. Throughout the last few months, His Lordship has pronounced innumerable verdicts on issues such as presentation of status reports on quarantine centers in Bihar, protection of policemen, healthcare staff from public attacks, diseases, etc. In fact, the bench of His Lordship on appreciating the role of policemen and healthcare staff have termed them with the expression guardian angels. Our foundation is delighted to have with us, you sir, today. We look forward to learn a lot from you in this session. Coming to our next panelist, Honorable Justice Anand Patak. Justice Patak was appointed as a judge of the High Court of Madhya Pradesh in the year 2016. Before his elevation to the bench, his lordship primarily practiced in civil, constitutional, revenue, criminal, contractual, and service matters in the High Court of Madhya Pradesh. In his tenure as a lawyer, Justice Patak had worked as worked in the worked in the office of the Advocate General from the year 2005 to 2009. He also appeared regularly as a counsel for the Western Railways, IRCTC, Employees Provident Fund, Madhya Pradesh Power Transmission Company, Hindustan Liver, ICICI, and the list is very endless. His lordship was also actively involved in the Kadalat framework of the country for numerous years. I think this is a perfect opportunity also to unravel another thing before the audience. That's an unfamiliarized but very fascinating facet of his lordship's personality. At a very young age, Justice Bartok had received the private pilot license. Hence, as a license holder, his lordship is aware of the art and he's a talented flyer. He can fly aeroplanes. Also, Adding to the series of achievements in, in the field of sports, his lordships is a cricket player at the national level and a hockey and volleyball player at the state level in Madhya Pradesh. These facts clearly point out that his lordships is an all-round personality. As a prolific writer himself, his lordships has authored several intriguing write-ups on how bail orders can be interlinked with community service. A very interesting anecdote of Honorable Justice Patak includes granting a bail on the condition of planting trees, setting up of water harvesting facilities, community service at a primary health care center. In fact, his lordship by passing a judgment which directed the state government to compensate two falsely implicated accused in a criminal matter depicted how if anyone gets falsely implicated because of poor investigation and tainted prosecution, that person deserves a just compensation. In the year 2020, in the month of January, his lordship, while authoring a judgment, drew a very interesting criminological theory called broken windows theory, which underlined the fact that if a window is broken in a building and left unrepaired, all the windows will soon be broken. Therefore, his lordship emphasized that even targeting a minor disorder can also result in the reduction of an occurrence of a more serious crime. In fact, Justice Patak, in another judgment in January 2020, encouraged the state government to think about creating a national forensic science university that would teach various components of forensic science and their theoretical parts through different courses. I can only say that we are extremely honored to have with us today, sir, your presence. Our third panelist is Vikas Singh, sir. Mr. Vikas Singh has had a glorious practice of around 30 years in the Honorable Supreme Court of India. He was designated as a senior advocate in the year 2004, whereafter he served as the additional solicitor general for the government of India from 2005 to 2008. With a firm belief in... Budding talent, Mr. Singh has played a crucial role in mainstreaming the underprivileged youth in the domains of sports, education, and policies, and financial support was given to them to pursue their dreams. 
With a firm belief in philanthropic acts, Mr. Singh also graciously lent financial support to organizations engaged in working for the betterment of the underprivileged and differently able children. Sir was the first senior counsel to join the family of Can Foundation. Since then, he has been a pillar of support for our foundation has only helped us to reach greater heights. If not for your support, sir, we would not have been able to launch one of our flagship projects, Project Ekalavya, in the year 2019. It is for sir's magnanimity that he is such a renowned and revered icon in the legal industry that the Cannes Foundation is indebted to him forever. Moreover, in addition to financial support to those in need, sir has also spared his precious, precious time for the upliftment of those among the lower strata of the society. Some of the notable organizations to which he has contributed to, continues to contribute till date, are CRI, Handicapped Children's Association of India, etc. He is also a major proponent of girl education and he's extended active and visible support to organizations working in the field. I can only say it's an honor to have with us. Vikas Singh, sir, thank you, sir, for joining us. We have with us the Vice Chancellor of the National University of Advanced Legal Studies, Professor Dr. K.C. Sunny. Dr. Sunny has 30 years of experience as a teacher of the Kerala University and the Central University of Kerala, out of which 11 years he was a professor, for eight years he was a dean. After finishing his LLM examination with first rank in the university in the year 1986, he started his teaching career at the Kerala Law Academy and the institution in which he did his LLB and LLM. Later, he joined for research with UGC fellowship and secured a PhD. He joined the Kerala University Department of Law in Karyavatam campus in the year 1990. He is one of the most brilliant minds of the country. Dr. Sunni has published the book Corrupt Practices in Election Law and is an author of more than 45 research papers. Around 17 students, including two foreign students, successfully completed PhD under his supervision. Professor was an international observer to Nepal Constituent Assembly and the Bangladesh Parliament election in 2007. Being a skilled orator, Dr. Sunny has delivered lectures in 16 foreign languages and has conducted numerous interactive sessions in six foreign universities, including the Harvard Law School. Thank you so much, sir, for taking your time out and being a part of our webinar. We have two moderators, two eminent moderators. Prashant Viji is a partner at the Jyoti Sagar Associates, Bangalore. Prashant is a graduate from the National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata, from its first batch. After working for five years in Paras Kuhad and Associates in Delhi, he joined Krishnamurti and Company in Bangalore. And he finally has become a partner in the most prominent Jaisagar Associates in April 2011. He primarily specializes in commercial litigation and dispute resolution. He has been handling matters relating to company contracts, specific relief, intellectual property, banking, infrastructure, and arbitration. A member of the Bar Council of Delhi, and his practice areas include corporate dispute resolution, finance, and manufacturing and real estate sectors. Having extensive experience in appearing and conducting matters before various courts, tribunals, and quasi-judicial bodies. Mr. Prashant's involvement in this webinar would be a great asset. Thank you, Prashant, for being a part of this webinar. The second moderator of the day is Siddharth Sharma. Siddharth is an advocate in the Madhya Pradesh High Court. He is practicing primarily in the principal bench of the Madhya Pradesh High Court in Jabalpur. He also appears in the indoor bench. He practices in civil, criminal, and writ side at the High Court. It's an absolute pressure to have Siddharth also on board. Without further ado, I, I request Siddharth to... Yes, Mr. Shiram. ...have a PPT uh, about the... Can Foundation, it's ready. I, I request Siddharth to. Yeah, yes, you sure. Siddharth, thank you so much for handing me over the mic. I feel it's very important to practice what we preach and promote as well. 
and for can foundation i think they are doing a wonderful job by that because as the name of, the, of our topic is theory of social engineering it is also important that we follow social engineering ourselves before we give a lecture on it or try to elaborate on the topic and for that particular reason it's important to go through the presentation of can foundation to see what they have done in this field i request the members of the can foundation who are about to demonstrate the powerpoint presentation on him I would now request Professor Dr. K. C. Sadni, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of NU ALS Kochi, to give the welcome address on this webinar. Sir, I am sorry to point it out, but your mic is on mute. No, no. Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Karol. Honorable Mr. Justice. Anand Patak, Senior Advocate of the Supreme Court, Advocate Vigas Singh, EC Member of Can Foundation, Mr. Prashant Viji, Mr. Sita Sarma, Advocate MB High Court, Mr. Sriram Prakat, Executive Council Member, Can Foundation, 
dear teachers students lawyers and other well wishers of can foundation today we are discussing a topic having great significance in the constitutional system of governance in india as observed by danville austin indian constitution is a social document and it intends social revolution the revolution intended by our constitution is to abolish to abolish the caste based caste hierarchical and gender based society existed in india for centuries and to create an egalitarian society having equal status and opportunity to all sections of the society in this process the role of the high courts in india is very very significant because through our constitution judicial independence is ensured in addition the, the high courts are armed with the necessary powers under article 226 and 227 of the constitution and or in as far as the proximity of proximity of order of citizens are concerned they are very very close to high court rather than supreme court so the high courts can play a key key role in the process of ensuring distributive justice under the constitution of india and under the standards reflected in the international documents relating to human rights judiciary can give dynamic interpretations to the provisions of the constitution the high courts can make the lower judiciary very dynamic and activity and active and people oriented by way of exercising its powers under article 227 and general powers of administration judiciary high court can effectively use new institutional mechanisms like state legal service authorities mediation center etc etc so there are so many courses of actions to be followed fortunately we have eminent persons giving insights to various dimensions of this topic firstly we have honorable justice sanjay karol who has made substantial contribution through his judicial pronouncement and through his role as an activist i will use i, I like to use that term sir on behalf of this conference i extend a warm welcome to you sir we have with us justice anand padak of madhya pradesh high court who made substantial contribution to the development of law through his judgments in addition he is also very active in playing the role of a social engineer in spite of the fact that he is a member of the higher judiciary of the country it is nice to hear honorable justice anand padak sir on behalf of this function i extend a warm welcome to you we have with us eminent lawyer of the supreme court vikas singh it is nice to hear that he is supporting this system the initiatives of this young advocates to make their own contribution in the matter of ensuring distributive distributive justice definitely your contribution and support will be a very crucial factor in the in the future courses of actions adopted by this young lawyers and law students sir on behalf of this function i extend a warm welcome to you sir then coming to the opus bearers of can foundation and the moderator moderators it is nice to see that 
the alumni of the national law universities are very particular in performing their role as social engineers at the time of establishment of nlus some scholars and judges used the term fancy institutions to describe nlus that is they are far away from the ordinary man and they are living in another world etc etc but through their activities this young lawyers proved that they are not living in another world they are part and parcel of our ordinary citizens and ordinary lit litigants and the, and have nots and persons who who are not having the sufficient capacity financially and educationally so it is nice to see uh, i am very happy in welcoming all these young friends firstly mr prashant vijay partner j sagar associates and executive council member of can foundation mr sitar sharma advocate madhya pradesh high court and finally mr sriram prakat who is the alumni of myon institution national university of advanced legal studies so many law teachers are present office bearers of can foundation are present here so many young lawyers are here law students are here other well wishers of can foundation are here on behalf of this meeting i extend a warm welcome to all of you thank you very much thank you so much dr sunny for the welcome address i was asked to speak briefly on the topic for a minute or two and i think the best can be done is by quoting a passage from the keshavan and the bhakti case as per paragraph number i am reading from paragraph 1478 of from keshavan and the bhakti was a state of kerala a modern state has to usher in and deal with large schemes having social and economic content it has to undertake the challenging task of what has been called social engineering the essential aim of which is the eradication of the poverty upliftment of the downtrodden the rising of the standards of the vast mass of people and the narrowing of the gulf between the rich and the poor as occasions arise often when the individual rights clash with the larger interest of the society the state acquires the power to subordinate the individual rights to the larger interest of society as a step towards social justice as observed by rosco pound on page 434 of volume 1 of jurisprudence under the heading limitations on the use of poverty and inside quotations today the law is imposing social limitations limitations regarded as involved in social life it is endeavoring to delimit the individual interest better with respect to social interest and to confine the legal right or liberty or privilege to the bounds of the interest so delimited further a book of predmen called the legal theory is also quoted but modern democracy looks upon the right to property as one conditioned by social responsibility by the needs of society by balancing of interest which looms so large in modern jurisprudence and not as a preordained and untouchable private right it's important that this it's important to observe that this concept of social engineering was also observed in perhaps the most famous the judgments of the supreme court i now invite honorable justice karol to give the keynote address on the topic good evening uh... everyone and a professor shri kesh sunni my co-panelist uh, justice anand patak and uh, mr uh, vikas singh is 
his image is as tall as he is. Prashant, Siddharth, and everyone who is today with us. In the last uh, two months that I have interacted with Ken, uh, and have uh, seen what uh, you have uh, demonstrated today, I will begin by saying that uh, the proverb, where there is a will, there is a way, I would add to that, that when it comes to can, C-A-N, there is always a way for those who have their head and heart in the right place. And this is what can has taught me. Social engineering, re-engineering, distributive justice is to stay for all times. I would broadly My note is divided into basically, primarily, four sections. One, the constitution, the aspirations. Two, part three and part four, the interplay and how the difference was obliterated subsequently. Next, the role of the constitutional courts, more specifically the high courts, and a word of caution in exercise of that. When talking of uh, social transformation through the higher judiciary, the context that surrounded the drafting of our constitution sets the stage for our discussion. The Constitution of India, the longest constitution in the world, marked a radical break of multiple years. It signified the emergence of a unified and sovereign nation after two centuries of colonial expression, oppression, and exploitation. It also laid out a bold new social vision designed to reorder and dismantle the worst excesses and indignities of traditional social practices. Much has been written about the Constitution as a socially transformative and progressive document using universal adult franchise and a bill of rights as the foundation to undo centuries of entrenched hierarchy. A set of civil and political rights, that is the right of life to equality before law against discrimination on the ground of sex, caste, race, etc. are all laid out in part three, the fundamental rights chapter. And these rights can be claimed by aggrieved individual parties against the state. And of course, in certain cases against individuals, Article 17 and Article 21, in the court of law. These rights are broadly conceptualized as the freedoms from the arms of the state, freedom from state encroachment into individual capacities and form the minimum necessary conditions of a modern liberal democracy. How did the language of uh, rights drafted by the Constituent Assembly translate to the citizens? Recent legal writers, I'm sure even Professor, Professor Sunny would say, have persuasively demonstrated that even in the early years of the Republic, 
ordinary citizens in India, be it a vegetable seller, a trader, or a butcher, were clearly conscious of the constitutional text and vigorously engaged with its language and framework of values of a judicial forums. The constitution is a lived reality experienced by the people in their vocabulary and in their behavior towards institutions and to other citizens. There's a counterpoint to this and their critical commentators also who draw attention to the collaborative, ideologically diverse, yet ultimately unelected and elite makeup of the constituent assembly. The gulf between the rights enshrined in the constitution and the experiences of those rights by the average person, the common man on the street is perhaps best captured in what an eminent writer, Sadat Hassan Manto, had to say in his short story, Maya Kanu. The story is, revolves around the Tonga driver in Lahore. He's excited, awaiting the promulgation of the Government of India Act 1935, which he has heard will bring self-rule to Indians and finally send the despicable Englishman packing out of his country. On the day act is passed, this Tonga driver gets into a fight with an English customer for charging a very high fee. To his shock, he's dragged away by two constables. Despite his shouting, wo din guzar gaya jab Khalil Khan khafat uraya karte the. Ab naya kanun hai miya naya kanun. The police ignore him, dismiss his utterances as rubbish and lock him up. The author, through this wry and piercing narrative, shows us how despite the best effort of its makers, the law may still feel alien, foreign, and even oppressive to our masses. I pose this question to myself after several opinions. Have we even to achieve what the constitutional makers had sought to at that point in time? Has every deprived and marginalized citizen got what the constitution had wanted, had wanted at that point in time? For me, every such person who is deprived and marginalized still continues to be the Tonga driver of the famous author. The Constituent Assembly was not just tasked with laying the blueprint of political democracy after colonialism. The drafters of the constitution were aware of the devastating poverty of the majority in New India. Not only poverty, there were other big challenges. Plurality was another challenge. They realized that political democracy was essential, but not enough to secure welfare and enduring social change. Political democracy had to be accompanied by a set of social and economic directives pertaining to citizens' health, education, and livelihood. All of these are basic goods essential for the proper flourishing of individual human capability and development. In philosophical discourse, these socioeconomic rights place positive obligations upon the state. As a set of proactive measures, the state must undertake to secure collective welfare. This is evident from the preamble 
itself, we the people, is a part of the constitutional basic structure. It has a certain revolutionary thrust as it seems to transform socio-economic structure of our society. The directive principles of the state policy, part four of the constitution, are the primary articulations of the social and economic entitlements in our constitution. They include not just measures for securing collective economic welfare, but also clauses relating to administration, foreign policy, and social welfare. The heterogeneous, some critics would call it inconsistent, list of these principles reflects the diversity of perspectives and ideologies present in the Consul Assembly. This is also a reflection of the consensus building value of the principles chapter. Despite strong and vocal disagreement among many distinct ideological factions in the assembly, the accommodation of their dissents within the text of the constitution, the diversity reflects the consent that the different groups gave to the bound by unifying liberal constitution. As uh, initially understood, the key difference between part four and part three was that part four was not justiciable. Article 37 clearly laid it like that. Indeed, this feature and the title of the chapter itself elicited spirited debate in the constant assembly with some members deeming these principles as ineffectual and redundant for their non-justiciability. Apart from reflecting and reorganizing the diversity of perspectives, the principles also signal the constitution makers' recognition of constitutional prudence, legitimacy, and the necessity of constitutions to be forward-looking and flexible without shackling future governments. Ambedkar himself signaled at precisely this flexibility in the debates while stating that the constitution lays down the mechanisms for political democracy and while being clear that economic democracy is an ideal that the state must strive towards. He acknowledged that there are multiple means of achieving economic democracy. Therefore, these principles and the language are deliberately framed to not be inflexible or rigid and leaving room for future persons, be it uh, Justice Anand or be it uh, Mr. Vikas or any one of us to read, think and interpret. The, and as also the leaders to persuade the electorate as to the best way of reaching economic democracy. It would be a misnomer to deem the principles ineffectual or redundant just because they are textually distinct from the fundamental rights and non-enforceable. On the contrary, these principles act along with the preamble as a set of structuring values that must guide all future parliaments, the citizens of India, as also the constitutional functionaries on whom there is great uh, trust reposed under the constitution. In any case, as we have seen, this was, a, this was in the beginning when the constitution was enacted. But later on, honorably Supreme Court stepped in. And in the last few decades, the higher judiciary has been instrumental in realizing the fuller integrated visions of part three and part four of the constitution together. Several of these principles have been read into the fold, the right to life, article 21, 
the right to life as the supreme court has famously held is just not bare animal existence but includes the right to live with dignity the right to have basic amenities of life and to carry such functions and activities as include the bare minimum expression of human self the apex court when dealing with the cases of uh, bonded laborers in bandwa mukti they also held that article 21 derives its life breath from the directive principles of state policy and at least therefore must include protection of the health and strength of workers men and women and of children against abuse opportunities and facilities for children to develop in a healthy manner and in conditions of freedom and dignity just and humane conditions of work and maternity relief there are anti number of cases one after the other i'm sure speakers here and after shall deal with it but let me also refer to just three four of them education article 21 has been included in unni krishna food pocl pertains to bihar shelter and livelihood alaga tellers and medical care comes from bengal in doing so the courts have arguably laid out the social minimum that is constitutionally essential and must be provided to all citizens to use political philosopher john rawls formulations what the apex courts jurisprudence emphasizes and what high courts around the country have since dutifully upheld is that civil and political rights can not be meaningfully exercised without securing socio economic security the lofty stature of equality before law and the fundamental freedoms is meaningless to a litigant who is homeless starving or uh, unemployed i was uh, just having a data what was the population of india in 1947 and what is the population in 2020 what is the ratio how many are educated what is the literacy rate and uh, how many are below bpl the figures are shocking really we have a duty to ensure that the constitutional spirit and the values and uh, everything which is enshrined therein must reach to them part 3 and part 4 are not intractable opposites in fact they are complementary and supplementary to each other or in nelson mandela's pithy words we do not uh, want freedom without bread nor do we want bread without freedom as uh, father of the nation said held must head high the high courts are in my opinion in certain senses better placed to put the principles of distributive justice to work this is for several structural reasons one the review powers of the high court under 226 as also the statutory powers under various statutes are uh, there and the review power under 226 is wider than uh, perhaps article 32 two the high courts are closer to ground reality and far more accessible to ordinary litigants three the high courts decisions still carry the finality of an appellate court because of poverty distance people may still not afford litigation and have access to supreme court therefore as far as high courts are concerned they are the last courts for them these features make the high courts better place to access local conditions 
and be specific and detailed in its orders. High courts around the country have thus, even in extraordinary times like the present one, since March, all of us are reading with this adversity, have been able to swiftly issue directions to the state to implement existing schemes immediately and provide for people's ration, food supplies, access to medical care, and even burial rights. The statutory authorities, like the legal services authorities, have played a vital role all throughout the country. In many ways, the proximity of the high courts to community needs allow them to come up with creative and uh, progressive solutions that can truly engineer and transform community relations. I can give you three examples from Himachal Pradesh. I take pride in the fact that at that point of time, I was there. We had engaged the jail inmates who were convicts under 302. The concept of open air jail is there all over the country. But if, uh, as uh, if most of you would have visited Simla, on the ridge, there's a book cafe. There used to be a book cafe. Now, the book cafe was being run by these two jail inmates who were convicts under 302. They would come every day in the morning, open the cafe, spend the day there, and return to jail. Now, they to become paralegal volunteers. So whosoever visited the book cafe at the historic place on the ridge, legal, whatever their requirement was, they were sensitized and made aware and they were helped. Another example, seven lakh children of Himachal Pradesh were engaged in tree plantation of forestation drive. It is there in the part four and four A of the constitution. And they were engaged not only in a forestation, but also to see that they adopt the tree, visit the tree every three months. Now this process was continued for about one year. Eventually, the role which the High Court can play is I'm emphasizing on that. The state government came out with a legislation ensuring that the trees which were planted by the children are now protected, are protected by the state. In this way, not only the constitutional values are ingrained in them, but also children ensure green coverage, green cover in barren, on barren lands. Yet another example, the heritage uh, Mr. Vikas has been to Simla, the UNESCO World Heritage Site, the railway track. The whole track on a single day was cleaned through by engaging all the stakeholders and which led to the railway ministry de declaring not only four more heritage engines for making it function on that site, but also ensuring that whatever encroachments were there, they were removed. Now, all this was not by way of a judicial verdict, but the proactive role which the High Court played through the statutory obligation and duty, which was in, under the Legal Services Act. And all this was there to uh, fulfill the constitutional goals and the directive principles as also the fun duties enshrined both under part four and part four A there. I would now come to a little role of caution. And 
same time, courts must be cautious to not step into the role of prescribing policy. The expansion of Article 21 was accomplished by various procedural innovations from relaxed locus standi to continuing mandamus that expanded access to the apex court for aggrieved persons. From 1980 onwards, we have seen how the Supreme Court has been expanding the jurisdiction. These have been critical tools in expanding the scope of judicial review of the actions of the executive. Perhaps scholars like Professor Sunny, who write on judicial overreach are correct in warning against courts legislating, which is the province of lawfully elected representatives of the people to continuously formulate guidelines and offer policy prescriptions would severely infringe on the separation of powers and harm the legitimacy of such decisions. Right to education, Supreme Court did, but then the legislatures came in and brought it in, brought it in part three. Vishakha, now the legislation is there. There are umpteen number of cases where Supreme Court has suggested, the high courts have suggested, and the legislatures have seen the wisdom and enacted. The point here is not that a litigant cannot approach the high courts seeking relief for, say, not receiving adequate health support during a pandemic. The point here is that the courts may do so only by usurping dialogue with the other two branches of the governments instead of mapping the policy itself. The executive and the legislature are best placed to calibrate the execu execution and implementation of the socioeconomic welfare measures in light of specific targets, budgetary allocations, and resource constraints. Only the administrator knows where the money is going to come from. The role of the judiciary is not to step into the executive or the legislative assembly's shoes. It must instead harness the judicial process to probe the government's actions and ask the government to justify its decisions and demonstrate that it took reasonable and proportionate measures towards the progressive realization of a particular socio-economic right. This deliberate method, whereby all participating parties are forced to explain the rationale behind their actions and be open to scrutiny and counter arguments is the judiciary's greatest strength and that court should employ to act as the sentinel on the world view. I must here also add that much emphasis is made day in and day out on the constitutional rights. Time has now come also to ensure that each one of us are made aware, sensitized on the constitutional duties which are there in the constitution, which are there in the constitution. I would request can to at some point of time have a discussion on that uh, issue. With these words, I thank Ken, I thank my co-panelists, and I thank the viewers and everyone for giving me this opportunity of expressing my views. Thank you very much, please. Thank you, sir. I thought uh, that was a very insightful account from Honorable Justice Carol. Uh, the speech that he presented before us typically stood for all the virtues that he typically stands for, all the grace that he typically stands for. As graceful as he is, as soul-searching as he is, his speech testified that, uh, that, that uh, the eminence will always be a grace to the higher judiciary that uh, he adopts. 
Now, we are not, I am not getting into the details of what he spoke right now because we have a set of questions following. Uh, but essentially, it is very endearing to note that Justice Carroll started with a very soul searching question as to whether the law has failed to address the concerns of the common man and took us through what the High Court can do and ended by saying what the High Court should not do. We will possibly get into the finer details when we come to more questions. Uh, at this stage, we will go on to our next speaker, Honorable Justice Anand Patak. He is uh, well known for his scholarship in law, outside the law, and I am told that he has very deeply touched the lives of many in the state of Madhya Pradesh. Over to you, sir, Honorable Justice Anand Patak. Honorable Chief Justice Sanjay Karol respected Chief Justice of Patna High Court, Shri Vikas Singh Ji, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India, and Patron on Board, Can Foundation, Professor Dr. K. P. Sunny, Vice Chancellor, NUALS, Kochi, Shri Siddharth Gupta, CEO, Can Foundation, Moderator Shri Prashant Viji, Partner Sagar Associates and Shri Siddharth Sharma, Advocate Madhya Pradesh High Court, all students of law who are participating in this webinar, and ladies and gentlemen. Today we are over the e platform to exchange views on social engineering and distributive justice. And organizers very aptly selected the topic because six months before, nobody could have thought of exchanging views through webinar. And this itself is social engineering. Concept of social engineering is a jurisprudential development on relation to the sociological school of jurisprudence, which for the first time was propounded by Dr. Dean Roscoe Pong. Social engineering as postulated by Dr. Pau goes on to state that law is manifestation of the social needs. And the implementation of law be such that it should cater to the needs of the society by attaining maximum level of satisfaction of the society and to reduce the competing interest between the inhabitants of the society. For him, law is social engineering, which means balance between the competing interests in the society. Here I would like to quote a shloka of Achar Brahaspati, which can be considered as one of the bottom lines of justice and concept of social engineering and distributive justice may revolve around it. It goes like this. Yavat Briet Jataram Tavat Swatvam Hi Dehinam Adikapi Yobi Manyot Sir Steno Dandmarati. Artha, if a man steals a piece of bread to satiate his hunger, he deserves to be pardoned for this act. But if after his hunger being satiated and thereafter he steals a piece of bread, then surely he is liable for punishment. Justice. It is the first promise we made to ourselves through our preamble. And therefore, justice is a non-negotiable -negoti principle in courts. Although doctrine of separation of powers assigns a specific sphere and authority to different organs of the state, but it is to be kept in mind that the doctrine is regarding separation of powers and not the separation of constitutional goals. Therefore, as my Lord has said, preamble, fundamental rights, directive principles, and fundamental duties are to be seen in that perspective, being repository of 
constitutional goals and its spirit. Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Delhi Transport Corporation versus DTC Mazdoor Sang, AIR 1991 Supreme Court 101, held that law is a social engineering to remove the existing imbalance and to further the progress. Serving the need of socialist democratic Bharat under rule of law. Another judgment, Constitution Bench of Apex Court in D.S. Nakra versus Union of India, AIR 1983, Supreme Court 130, explained that law is an instrument of social engineering. And to be pragmatic is not to be unconstitutional. In its onward march, law as an institution ushers in socio-economic justice. Respected members and friends, justice dispensation involves adjudication, occupation, and education. Adjudication is of cases by judges. It is an occupation pursued by lawyers as a profession. An education which is symbiotic in nature, wherein lawyers and judges educate and enrich each other by their knowledge, experience, and wisdom. Therefore, one of the attributes which is to be inculcated in both these stakeholders in the institution is the thought that they are basically healers in the society who try to treat and heal the patients or litigants. Therefore, they are to be inculcated with the thought that every file with same alphabets contains a life. Nobody can forget the contribution of jurists like Justice Krishna Iyer, Justice P. N. Bhagwati, Justice O. Chinappa Reddy, Justice D. A. Desai, Justice Y. V. Chandrachu, and some other like-minded judges who cherish their vision of justice as reflected in their various judgments and made social justice the guiding force for judicial activism, public interest litigation, law reforms in the country, and several other reforms. PILs, dilution of, as my Lord has said, dilution of locus standi doctrine, substantial modification of adversarial litigation, and democratization of judicial remedies paved the way of access to justice to the marginal sections of society. From those concepts, legal aid schemes, Lok Adalat, alternative dispute repressal, ADR, this ADR mechanism, these all came into place as offshoot of all these years of social engineering. Paucity of time compels me not to elaborate, but their thoughts virtually propelled social engineering and distributive justice. We cannot forget the cases like Bandhuva Mukti Morsha, or PILs, Babu Singh versus State of UP, AIR 1978 Supreme Court, Moti Ram and others versus State of Madhya Pradesh, 1908 Supreme Court, for bail conditions by Justice Krishna here. And as moderator Mr. Sharma has referred, Keshwanand Bharti case for basic structure doctrine. In 4th century BC, Plato's Republic and in different commentaries and treatises of our scholars, Indian scholars, relationship between law and justice had been discussed. And Selman does not lag behind when he says, right or justice comes first 
in the order of logical conceptions and law comes second as its derivative concept of distributive justice is one of the species under the genus of justice and is a thought from jurist sir john rawls social engineering and distributive justice supplement each other and at times contradict also because the concept of social engineering precisely followed the principle that the maximum satisfaction should be attained for the majority people and the concept of distributive justice goes on to quote that the actions should be adopted which attains the maximum satisfaction for the lowest strata however theory of distributive justice is one of the important theories of justice reflected in indian judgments right from case of state of madras versus shrimati champakam 1951 supreme court to indra sahani 1993 supreme court and kathumma versus state of kerala 1978 supreme court to recent judgment of narind versus state of up 2017 judgment this theory guided the authors of judgment in honorable supreme court first of all so far as high court under the high courts under the constitution in this perspective is concerned it would be useful to remind us about the scope and powers of high courts under article 226 of the constitution as my lord has put in because this provision includes writs for enforcement of fundamental rights under part 3 but for any other purpose also as my lord was pointing this and perhaps scope is definitely i would say scope is much wider because expression any other purpose gives scope for social engineering and distributive justice beside judicial review regarding statutes i courts time and again have entertained the petitions not only for enforcement of fundamental rights but for other purposes also whereby the useful public interest litigations were entertained and decided in favor of public at large which ranges from establishment of institutions to constructions of roads beside course correction for executive actions reference of different orders passed by madhya pradesh high court in protecting the rights of austies over dam built over narmada river has been a landmark bearing in respect of rehabilitation and resettlement of austies holy river shipra at ujjain and its purification protecting of tribal's interest were product of this thought and it was the high court which was instrumental in giving justice to the teachers and staff of grant in aided colleges when their grant was stopped by state government dr shari kali and others versus state of mp decided by division bench of madhya pradesh high court was the judgment authored by honorable shri jasprit deepak mishra sir as lordship then was while heading the division bench himachal pradesh high court in rakesh chand in year 2008 observed that not giving the benefit of revised pay scale to teachers on the basis of agreement was arbitrary and violative of article 14 of constitution this was distributive justice list would be exhaustive but for bringing the contemporaneous into the discussion i intend to refer the proactive steps taken by different high courts for taking care of plight of common public and migrant workers during covid 19 pandemic and its different followers since i am privileged to share the platform with honorable the chief justice of patna high court 
so i would be happier to refer the suo moto cognizance taken by my lord while heading division bench at patna high court after noticing an incident where a toddler was seen trying to wake up his dead mother at the muzaffarpur railway station at bihar this was an attempt to wipe out the tears of downtrodden kerala high court also took the cognizance and even took care of welfare of animals during lockdown in a writ petition filed by a citizen n prakash our own high court madhya pradesh high court took some proactive steps through different petitions for welfare of migrant workers because madhya pradesh was the transit point for them in some bail orders also as a condition litigants and lawyers volunteered their resources at their disposal as bail condition to take care of migrant workers and other persons even madhya pradesh high court has taken thoughts and leaf from altruistic ideas and judgments of jurists like the galaxy referred above initiated in corporation of condition of plantation of trees and community service as one of the conditions in cases for restoration of petitions got dismissed in default in cases of suspension of sentence and even in cases of bails while taking while taking resort to section 4373 of crpc this is a provision which itself is of wider connotation and incorporated after report of law commission apparently to give scope for such social engineering thousands of plants came up as a green cover especially in gwalior region a place which is otherwise denuded of vegetation many acus adopted hospital service installation of water harvesting system rendering of services at orphanage and mercy homes and many more even served in mice mass migration during this pandemic covid 19 this initiative of high court is also a reflection of social engineering even an app is in the process of development for monitoring of such activities very recently day before yesterday only division bench of madhya pradesh high court indor bench passed an order directing supply of oxygen by way of direction to the supplier of maharashtra for uninterrupted supply of oxygen for covid 19 patients of madhya pradesh because supplier is at maharashtra and because of circular of maharashtra government he expressed his inability to serve this is also another example of distributive justice with the as my lord has pointed out regarding legal services rendered by state legal authorities with the promulgation of this legal services authorities act salsa and dalsa state legal services authorities and district legal services authority they are trying to spread over the new paths of social engineering and distributive justice and they are monitoring different social welfare schemes in states even digitization and computerization of high courts like cims system in our high court also strengthen the access to justice by providing information and status of case over a click to the litigants and cases are listed without delay one important aspect about high courts under our constitution is that high courts provide the platform where initial discussion regarding a subject or controversy takes place and from there the dispute travels to honorable supreme court to get fate a comply many path breaking judgments travel through different high courts 
and ultimately explained and settled by apex court we cannot forget the constitutional bench decision of gurbakhsh singh sidia versus state of punjab air 1980 supreme court 1632 which explains the scope of section 438 crpc anticipatory bill and it traveled through punjab and haryana high court again list is wrong and time constraints do not permit me to do so but point which i am trying to make is that high courts provide a platform for further discussion at apex level even at times different high courts pass different orders and a particular subject is seen from many angles and this angular deviation virtually enriches the discussion and ultimately gets explained by honorable supreme court not only this regarding article 227 of the constitution power of superintendents over all courts by the high court cannot be undermined because it decides the controversy in respect of procedural laws and private law remedies almost conclusively because we have to keep in mind that for majority of the litigants as my lord has referred high court is the final authority their limited resources do not allow them to take their disputes up to apex level therefore in that perspective also role of high courts assume importance because they cater the need of very poor and marginalized people and while providing them speedy and meaningful justice itself is distributive justice here i would like to add that high courts can consider the cases for concluding those cases once and for all like in some matters of matrimonial disputes once case of maintenance under section 125 crpc is taken and considered holistically then it can decide three four cases which may be filed parallel to it or may be in the offing even once a case of revenue dispute is settled it may lead to settlement of many existing as well as pregnant disputes likely to travel from it therefore high courts can play major role in distributive justice in such jurisdiction also after lockdown majority of the courts work in uh, is performed work performed through video conferencing and this mechanism has been adopted successfully by all high courts across the nation no doubt physical hearing and its significance cannot pale into oblivion but this new mechanism strengthens the access to justice and now courts are available 24 by 7 even from distance if exigency permits so this transformation within 6 months is an example of social and a logarithmic engineering combined much has been done and much is to be done new frontiers of social engineering and distributive justice need to be explored by high courts in improvement of policing and crime investigation jail reforms and pushing the spirit of speedy and substantive justice to the marginalized sections of society at greater pace before concluding i expect that social engineering would use big data science and data mining to undertake post litigation audit about impact of litigation and justice dispensation it can also take care to what extent justice dispensation translated into justice realization over the ground social engineering and distributive justice can also take care that concept of rule of law should become one of the essential components of 
infrastructure like water, electricity, roads, air, railways, because in absence of rule, rule of law, these components of development shall be sacrificed at the altar of misgovernance. Therefore, inclusion of concept of rule of law in legal discourses and social narratives would be the new challenge for the policy makers and jurists alike to make social engineering and distributive justice a longer road. Last but not the least, I conclude my statement with a quote of a French writer, Bowen argues. He says, emotions have taught mankind to reason. Emotions have taught mankind to reason. Through emotions, man reaches to reason or conclusion. Social engineering and distributive justice appear to be offshoots of this thought. Lastly, I am thankful to the respected and esteemed dignitaries sharing the dais and members of Ken Foundation to give me patient hearing. And I am also thankful to all the office bearers for providing such opportunity through webinar for expressing my views on the subject. I am thankful to all moderators and students involved in this event. I thank you all. Pranam. Thank you, Honorable Justice Pathak. That was a highly perceptive account. We thoroughly enjoyed uh, your presentation, right from the jurisprudential connect or disconnect between social engineering, justice, distributive justice as a species of justice, up to some live examples from history, some contemporary examples. It was a treat to us. We thank you so much. We will quickly, before we will come back to you with more questions, but we will now very quickly go on to our third speaker, Mr. Vikas Singh. Mr. Vikas Singh, for people like us, is the synonym of fearlessness. He is as tall as he is. He is literally and figuratively tall, and uh, he does not let uh, any stone unturned when he takes up a cause. He does not let an opponent browbeat him. He does not let a bench browbeat him. And as uh, fearless as he is, so much is he generous at heart. I understand that from the generous contributions that he provided, not one but two students, needy students, were able to be provided support by the Cannes Foundation last year in their education. And uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Vikas Singh, all yours. Justice Sanjay Karol, Justice Anand Pathak, Justice uh, Mr. Professor K.C. Sunni, Siddharth Gupta, Siddharth Sharma, Sriram, Prasant. This is a very, uh, I would say, um, you know, very difficult moment for me because when we have two very erudite speakers speaking on the same subject before you, and if you have to speak on the same on that subject last then it is always a very challenging task. But of course, the advantage is that while speaking, I have had the benefit of the discourses given by Justice Karol and Justice Pathak, very illuminating. And of course, I will also try to present some different views, which, which uh, without trying to sort of, you know, duplicate what has already been said. Before uh, starting, I would also like to thank uh, Can Foundation for this opportunity because this is a very uh, a good way and Justice Patek very rightly pointed out that six months back, we could not have thought of having something like this. Although technology was there, but it was not being used. And now because of the pandemic and because of this technological uh, usefulness that has come out of these webinars and these online platforms, that the wheels of justice has kept on moving because unfortunately if this, is, this had not been there, probably the wheels of justice would have come to a grinding halt and that would not have been the larger interest of the justice dispensation. 
this topic is a very uh, unique kind of a topic and it's it's a topic which really uh, very thought provoking it really makes you think as to what what should be a, a proper way of presenting the the subject which has been earmarked for today social engineering is is basically the practice of changing laws and of changing interpretations of fundamental law to change society in accordance with political ideals so that is social engineering and distributive justice of course is justice owed by a community to its members including fair allocation of common advantages and sharing common burdens so these are the two uh, uh, distinct parts of the topic before us today distributive justice in our jurisprudence has been you know held by some supreme court judgments and i feel uh, it will be opposite to quote from them today here in in lingappa pochanappa the supreme court said the concept of distributive justice in the sphere of law making connotes inter alia the removal of economic inequalities and rectifying the injustice resulting from dealings or transactions between unequals in society law should be used as an instrument of distributive justice to achieve a fair division of wealth amongst the members of the society based on the principle from each according to his capacity to each according to his needs distributive justice complements more than achieving lessening the inequalities by different taxation giving debt relief or distribution of property owned by one to many who have none by imposing ceiling on holdings both agricultural and urban or by direct regulation of contractual transactions by forbidding certain transactions and perhaps by requiring others it also means that those who have been deprived of their properties by unconscionable bargains should be restored with their property all such laws may take the form of forced redistribution of wealth as a means of achieving a fair division of material resources amongst the members of the society or there may be legislative control of unfair agreements distributive fairness can only be achieved by taxation or contractual regulation at some sacrifice in individual liberty aristotle's doctrine of justice of equality is called by him as cumulative justice which requires at least two persons while distributive justice requires at least three relative equality in treating different persons while granting relief according to need or reward and punishment according to merit and guilt is the essence of distributive justice while in commutative justice the two persons confront each other as co-equals three or more persons are necessary in distributive justice in which one who imposes burden upon or grants advantages to the others is superior to them therefore it presupposes an act of distributive justice which has granted to those concerned equality of rights equal capacity to act equal status according to rad branch distributive justice is the prototype of justice it is we have found the idea of justice towards which the concept of law must be oriented oriented law offers and protects the conditions necessary for the life of man and his perfection in the words of cardozo what we are seeking is not merely the justice that one receives when his rights and status are determined by the law as it is what we are seeking is a justice to which the law in which its making should conform the sense of justice will be stable when it is firmly guided by the pragma of objective and subjective interests the the uh, the uh, the it, directive principles actually are the enunciation of distributive justice in our constitution and justice uh, karol has very rightly pointed out that how uh, directive principles are not only just in part 3 but part 3 and part 4 have to be always looked at together to see how this uh, the uh, the constitution makers when they had a thought of certain directive principles to be fundamental in governance should also be ultimately utilized while deciding the rights of people uh, which is the fundamental rights and that is why the the uh, bridge between part 3 and part 4 is very essential 
for the purpose of distributive justice in this country. <clears throat> Some of the, uh, the you know, the uh, landmark uh, cases where the High Court has uh, come in aid to distributive justice, I would like to, I thought I would like to point out some of them. One was uh, decriminalization of uh, gay sex. Justice A.P. Shah in the Delhi High Court uh, was uh, heading the division bench which uh, decriminalized gay sex. And that was basically, again, a form of uh, distributive justice as well as social engineering. Because Ultimately, what two consenting individuals do within their closed rooms is no concern of the society. And to say that what they're doing by their choice is criminal is clearly an abhorrent act to think of in today's world, where we talk of equality as the guiding principle of all uh, um, jurisprudence. Similarly, in the case of Sati, Sati was abolished in 1833, but even after the, its abolition, this practice was still being followed. And there's a very interesting paragraph of Justice Wanchu when he was in the Rajasthan High Court, where one of the persons who uh, was, you know, abetting Sati was given a very light sentence by the lower court. And uh, to, uh, to, uh, to say that this was not right because it was something which was already abolished and it was not something which could have been said to be sort of permissive, he, he writes a very nice uh, paragraph because when the judge is giving us a light sentence, the, ju the Justice Wanchu is saying, he is still not sure about that judge. He is still not sure whether the people are wrong or right in their adoration of Sati. <clears throat> Though the law in this country has declared abetment of suicide to be a crime for over a hundred years, he seems to sympathize with the view of the people that it is their religious duty to help a woman who wants to become a sati. He has also made the observation that the custom of sati is a well-known custom and judicial notice can be taken of it. We are surprised at this. The custom which was prevalent up to 1833 was forbidden more than 100 years ago by law. We are therefore of the opinion that a sentence of six months rigorous imprisonment for such a barbarous act of abetment to suicide is ludicrous. It is essential that people should respect the law, which in this case is also, in our opinion, right, particularly a law which has been in force for over 100 years. In such cases of sati, therefore, which often on take place, we are of the opinion that a deterrent sentence is called for. Taking all circumstances into account, we consider that a sentence of five years rigorous imprisonment is the minimum that we can give to these accused. So this is how I feel that the judicial process has to evolve with time and, and to evolve with the, the new thought which is, which is emerging in society and, and uh, to take it forward in that manner. The other uh, judgments which are again important are of child labor where uh, high courts have uh, held very, uh, many, very many high courts have held. Triple talaq of course, Supreme Court where equality was considered in a different context altogether. Human rights, is another area where the high courts repeatedly come to the aid of the people in, in this distributive justice and social engineering. Providing of reservation is also another way of uh, doing uh, distributive justice and also of, uh, doing social engineering. In the uh, Schedule Ka Schedule Tribes Act, where uh, the um, uh, division bench of the Supreme Court had held that uh, there should be a preliminary inquiry before a person can be charged of an offense under the act. Uh, when the matter was referred to a larger bench, although personally I was of the view that the uh, view of the earlier division bench was correct, but the larger bench took a very, uh, uh, you know, very significant uh, uh, reasoning for upturning the uh, view held earlier. They said the whole purpose of giving, uh, protecting a scheduled caste, scheduled tribe who has been harassed will be defeated if in the inquiry which is to be done may be done by people who would be of the forward caste. And so nobody will depose and nobody will come out and say that actually what, is, what he claims to have happened has happened. And so the purpose of having a law where there is no bail for somebody who is charged of an offense will get defeated by this preliminary inquiry. 
so although personally i may not agree but it's it's a very uh, important thought i feel that uh, when you lo look at the downtrodden people of our society and when you look at people who have uh, suffered this kind of um, uh, you know discrimination for centuries and to bring them at par with our with everybody else in the society the courts have to play a very very uh, major role in um, uh, in, uh, in ensuring that uh, distributive justice uh, is is uh, administered as far as the migrant laborers are concerned which is a recent event and uh, my lord justice uh, karol and my lord justice pathak also referred to that incident i i have a different take on that the migrant labor issue was first raised before the supreme court and on the 31st of march unfortunately the supreme court carried, got carried away by a statement by the government of india that there is no migrant labor on the streets and uh, that every migrant labor has been taken care of and every migrant labor is in shelter homes and believing that statement the supreme court accepted and closed that public interest litigation in, in on 31st of march uh, 2020 itself now that was very unfortunate and um, later on also the supreme court uh, remained in that same uh, sort of uh, numbness uh, to this issue but i am very happy to say that the high courts of this country notwithstanding the attitude of the supreme court rose to the occasion and some of the high courts which uh, did the human service in this i would uh, definitely like to point out uh, the um, andhra pradesh high court on may 15 2020 passed an interim order in respect of migrants who were walking towards the home states and observed that if at this stage this court does not react and pass these orders this court would be failing in its role as a protector and alleviator of suffering on may 15 the bench issued orders that outposts as natural highway should be not just be food counters but also provide drinking water hydration salts and glucose packets and it should be equipped with paramedics or a doctor an ambulance should also be on the call there should be public toilets as well as sanitary pad dispensing machine the court issued strict directions on may 22 to be immediately followed to arrange buses within 48 hours and to arrange for trains within 96 hours and ask the government to not view the pil as an adversarial litigation my lord justice karol justice pathak has already mentioned in fact i wanted to mention that as well of uh, my lord taking so much motto of cognizance of that toddler was seen in that video Uh, in that Muzaffarpur station, and my Lord Justice Karol thereafter has in the Patna High Court uh, passed several orders uh, in, in this very very uh, grave situation, where if if you ask me, humanity itself, uh, especially the, these migrant people, are the ones whose fundamental rights were really impacted by the lockdown and by the pandemic, because the rest of us may have suffered economic um, um, uh, hardships. but the right to life and liberty was really at stake for them and not giving recourse to them would have was according to me a, a great uh, injustice and which was definitely corrected by the high courts uh, including patna high court of which justice karol passed these orders karnataka high court also passed orders with regard to uh, uh, non payment of fares uh, by uh, for the uh, travel of migrant laborers and uh, Uh, that that said that would violate fundamental rights if they were asked to pay their fare similarly madras high court also um, uh, on 15th of may passed very detailed order the uttar pradesh high court also passed orders uh, um, uh, on inhuman conditions at quarantine centers and for providing better treatment to corona positive people and uh, detailed guidelines were given in these judgment the gujarat high court also in a suo moto petition Uh, took cognizance of the uh, and and the high court said i must quote bound by a sense of duty responsibility and empathy it is now salient that private hospitals step in to deliver adequate health care to their people the judges of the high court have constantly reminded us that between court and symbol of legality and citizen the beneficiaries of justice not alienation but integration through social engineering and distributive should be the modus operandi may the tribe increase but in this i would like to uh, sort of uh, uh, end by saying uh, on this migrant labor issue that uh, yet this this is not a issue which is over yet and there is a lot to be done as far as the distributive justice is concerned one issue which really is very high on my mind and which i feel uh, needs to be brought out 
is uh, police reforms in this country because the enforcement of our laws ultimately are done by the police. And uh, the Supreme Court in 2006 in Pratash Singh case uh, had recommended police reforms and had said that uh, 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 the, the police should be completely outside the control of the executive and the uh, political bosses. But somehow none of the state governments, none of the political parties have accepted those reforms because of which the, the justice to the common man gets uh, impaired because uh, of the not proper functioning of the uh, policing uh, in the state in, in many ways and human rights violations also happen because of the same. So I, I, I personally feel that uh, high courts are having much wider powers than the Supreme Court while dealing with uh, problems of uh, this kind uh, uh, by the people of this country. And uh, the uh, red jurisdiction really is, is, uh, is, is much wider than what the uh, Supreme Court exercises under Article 32. In fact, the uh, High Court exercises the power of superintendence over the courts and below it, whereas Supreme Court does not exercise any such power of superintendence. And uh, if I remember correctly, Justice Sambesachi Mukherjee, while in the Calcutta High Court, had uh, recorded in a judgment that Supreme Court has no right to uh, direct the High Court to decide a particular matter in a particular time frame because that they said would be as if exercising power of superintendence, which the Supreme Court does not have. And um, uh, in, uh, in, in that sense, I, I totally agree with that view that uh, High Courts are the real uh, um, vehicles of uh, distributive justice and as well as social engineering. And I, I pray to the Almighty that the tribe of the like of Justice Karol and Justice Patak grow. And we have more such judges who are you know, humane and who look at the problems of the citizenry because ultimately the system is meant to meant for the people rather than the people. So we, we have to, we are all parts of that same uh, decision-making process. Uh, we as lawyers and the judges uh, sitting on the other side. And uh, our uh, duty is to see to it that uh, the citizens, wherever they are in, in some injustice, the red jurisdiction is used to uh, reach that injustice, even in a PIL, even if the person himself is unable to uh, uh, access justice because of uh, the fact that he is not having the capability to uh, move court uh, himself. So in the case of bonded laborers or, or you know, any exploitation of any kind, I feel high courts have a very, very uh, important role in, uh, in uh, ensuring that uh, we move uh, uh, to this uh, um, society where uh, there is less of inequality and uh, the common good is used for the maximum uh, numbers in, in, uh, in, 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 in the country. And once again, I would like to uh, thank the Can Foundation and uh, the um, you know the organizers for this opportunity. And I would also like to uh, thank the other panelists for their very erudite opinion and uh, uh, for this opportunity to share the dice with them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's uh, always uh, always a matter of interest to see how somebody who is predominantly in Supreme Court and Delhi looks at the role of high courts in our federal structure, what the high courts can do, cannot do, based on the cases that travel all the way up to Delhi. Uh, we will come back to you with questions. We have enough questions for all our speakers. Uh, I will start with my first question to Justice uh, Patak. Uh, this is something, sir, that Honorable Justice Patak, uh, this is something that you very briefly touched upon somewhere along the line of uh, your jurisprudential analysis. Uh, you had dealt with this apparent conflict potentially between social justice and individual justice. And that's a very interesting topic. We would like you to, we, we would want to hear more from you as to how as a judge of the High Court you would deal with issues of such conflicts between individual justice and social justice. You may have a privileged man in an underprivileged group or a class, you may have an underprivileged man in an otherwise privileged class. These are issues that can come up very often. We
we would like to have a little more elaborate uh, explanation from you as to how you would deal with as a high court judge should you come across a potential conflict between social justice and individual justice as uh, as i have already pointed out that to start with the thought that if the person if a judge is sitting with the thought that he has to act as healer first thing i am not saying that he will have to move out of the bounds of law because ultimately judges and or stakeholders are <clears throat> bound by the four corners of law after that beyond that i am saying that if one possesses this thought that he has that law should lead to justice this should be the first thought another that as i have pointed out that emotions have taught mankind to reason always we have a sixth sense that how this man can be given justice in a particular framework like i am telling you an example recently i encountered i think one year back when i was sitting in writ roster a lady came for writ of mandamus lawyer said sir she does not want anything major she only says that whenever his husband comes to home after consuming some bouts of liquor he beats him he beats her beats the lady and lady wants that beating to be stopped she never wants to leave that man because otherwise man is good but so far as his this part is concerned she wants something some remedy from you of that was a very peculiar situation because <clears throat> mandamus is discretionary we know how this mandamus to whom direction can be given because this is i think private law remedy you have to go to some family court and all so i devise a formula i said <clears throat> have you given any representation to any authority lawyer said that yes i made a report on her behalf about this mishandling but sho said ki what can i do and this is something which is not in my purview so i made a direction by saying that sho is at discretion to call the lady and the husband and will make a counseling as if a family counseling center and try to persuade and request the person not to behave in such a fashion when sho as mr singh has said when police person says anything to a person citizen then it has some meaning later on i found that i asked the lawyer ki what happened well they both they went to police station and police has resolved their dispute now they are living happily so this is this is the formula you have to devise on each and every individual case basis at times yes some some person who is a down trodden does not have law in his favor that is the dilemma we face and sometimes a well resourced person has law in his favor so any person on the ground of his status cannot be discriminated also that is that we have to see but at the same time if a person in such circumstance where discretion can be exercised we can make a uh, via via we can make a route or uh, formula for this but it there is a dilemma it exists and one has to encounter it and negotiate it thank you honorable justice patak we have uh, the next question to honorable justice sanjay karol uh, in fact sir your status before our audience is exalted to something very close to divine with all the examples that others spoke about you we of course know much about you uh, it was heartwarming to know about the suomoto cognizance that you took uh it was heartwarming to hear about your non judicial direction where children planted and adopted trees which eventually resulted in the legislation 
at the same time you had a word of caution against the judiciary uh, stepping into areas of policy making and legislation in that context since you are now today presiding over a state which has several maladies unfortunately it's got illiteracy problem it's got uh, despite all its cultural heritage and uh, uh, all its wealth on many other account unfortunately there are issues of illiteracy there are issues of maladministration there are issues of caste and religious uh, dynamic playing very very uh, uh, toxic role uh, there are issues of uh, uh, inequitable distribution of uh, resources under such circumstances when the voiceless man does not come to the court and on his behalf somebody else comes to the court do you think the pil jurisdiction has got a higher significance when it comes to states like what you are looking at and presiding over because i asked this in particular because in our last webinar honorable justice uh, uh, sanjay kishan call had uh, voiced some concerns about how the pil jurisdiction is leading to some very shrill discourses within uh, within our structure today but looking at it from the domain that you are presiding over today where do you see the role of a pil jurisdiction See, the diversity of Bihar is immense. Let me begin by saying that uh, to head an institution uh, like Patna High Court is in itself a matter of great pride and honor. Uh, there, I remember of an advertisement, perhaps one of those cola companies, it said that uh, Dil Mange More. So the more you do in Bihar is less. But at the same time, uh, we have to keep in mind that judges are not uh, modern day Robin Hoods. But that doesn't mean that the courts would not step in where they feel that yes, or they sense that the rights of the marginalized, the deprived, the downtrodden have to be protected and preserved. Illustratively, I'll just give you, see, I don't know whether you know or not, of course, the panelist, uh, Mr. Vikas would know, one tenth of India lives in Bihar. Oh, the more than more than about 52% or 55% of the population of Bihar comes from uh, the marginalized section. The ratio of population is almost 50-50 uh, between male and female. As per the census of 2011, the literacy rate is just 61%. Now, this is, and the highest migration out of Bihar, I would say, of people, of youth, uh, anywhere in India has been from Bihar. So these are the challenges which Bihar faces. The marginalized ones, they have to be protected. They have to be preserved. And that is why I have no doubt in my mind that uh, the writ jurisdiction has to be exercised extensively and with an open heart and mind and with magnanimity. There's no doubt about it. I'll just uh, tell you, you know, the complexity of the problem of Bihar. Today, the matter is over, therefore I'm sharing it with you on this platform. The enormity of the problem. Uh, the, 
High Court took a so much of cognizance on the news report of a newspaper uh, where children during this current time had been deprived of their, you know, uh, midday meal services. And uh, not only that, what was uh, shocking was that they had gone down to rag picking and beggary. So when we, you know, took so much of cognizance and then we, we should notice, immediately the action was rectified. And that's about end all. We were about to close it. And therefore, you know, when I say that we should not, uh, beyond a particular point, not expand the jurisdiction. But we were about to close it when one shocking statement came to our notice. And that being that in Bihar, 1 crore 19 lakh children were deprived of their right to education. Now, a big challenge before us, before the executive, before the administrators. How do you bring back into the educational mainstream? Who takes care of their nutritional needs? Who monitors them? What is the program? Because this pandemic is going, to, is going to be there. Children, see, you and I can understand this pandemic. You and I can also, or children who are in their 10th and higher secondary or in colleges, they can understand what zero year means. But those who are in lower classes, in the primary sections, for them, it is hunger which is most important and to keep them engaged in this challenge. So we have issued certain directions. What I'm saying is that, yes, these are huge, huge challenges. People have to be told about their rights, basic rights. Illustratively, I'll just tell you. In this pandemic, everyone came home. Not one single voice raised by a woman, I don't know why, of uh, their rights being, uh, of their being deprived of their rights. I really don't know. Is it that because the society is civilized and accepted them? Or is it that uh, their voice is suppressed and they have no voice at all? But these are all issues of uh, importance and significance. And there's a whole lot to do as far as uh, engaging ourselves in uh, fulfilling the constitutional obligations and ensuring that justice, uh, which is there in the preamble, is uh, rendered to the needy and to the deprived. Yes, that's my point. Thank you. I thank Honorable Sri Justice Sanjay Karol for sharing his view. The initiatives taken by your Lordship, they make us feel confident in the judicial system of the country when we look at newspaper articles in various situations wherein we see India as a very less developed country as compared to the Western part of the world. The actions taken by your Lordships make us feel that there is a ray of hope for this country after all, in spite of all the problems that we face. I would cite a judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Ashok Kumar Gupta versus State of UP, 1997, Volume 5, SCC 201. The permanent bureaucracy in Part 14 of the Constitution is an integral scheme of the Constitution to aid and assist the political executive in the governance of the country. Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest presidents of the United States of America, a noble soul who laid his life in giving right to equality to the blacks, a living truth enshrined in the 14th Amendment had stated that democracy is by the people, of the people, and for the people. Democracy governed by rule of law brings about change in the social order only through rule of law. Every citizen or group of people has right to a share in the governance of the state. 
the lordships in the last few lines had observed that it was held that law is a social engineering to remove the existing imbalance and to further the progress serving the needs of the socialist democratic bharat under the rule of law the prevailing social conditions and actualities of life are to be taken into account in at judging whether or not the impugned legislations would serve the purpose of the society my question is to mr vikas singh sir in a follow up question that was asked to honorable chief justice sanjay karol 70 to 80% of litigants especially litigants coming from under developed state in comparison with the pain capacity with the litigants who are coming from developed parts of india the high court seems to be a court of the last resort going to the supreme court is unimaginable for them in fact when they engage a lawyer in the high court they are still of the mindset that a lot of money is going to be spent in the high court as well so for them the chance of knocking the doors of the supreme court are unimaginable so my question to you is how can the high court stand up to meet the aspirations of people particularly in the exercise of its dis discretionary jurisdiction well um, high courts because of the uh, nature in which the proceedings go on in a high court the <coughs> justice access to justice is much easier more proximate uh, cheaper because uh, it's easier to you know engage a lawyer at a much lesser lesser cost in the high court than in the supreme court but my ultimate say on this point will be that uh, i will request uh, the collegiums of every high court to ensure that when they select names the only consideration should be merit because unfortunately and that is where i have had a huge uh, issue even when i was president of the supreme court bar and i have been taking this up even now with the government that unfortunately there is no database of the eligible group of lawyers and consideration of all of them while elevating because if you select good people you will get good justice if you select people who do not have the capacity to understand or who do not have the experience or do not have you know sufficient work have not done much of work then the litigant who you know expects the high court to be the court of last resort will not unfortunately get justice and that is where uh, um, uh, every every collegium according to me has a huge task to perform when the supreme court has taken upon itself the responsibility to appoint judges i think it's a it's a responsibility which is it's a uh, it's a it's a power taken with a lot of responsibility and for that there has to be a mechanism where the best of the best are should be selected and that is the only way we can ensure that litigants get justice uh, at the high court level thank you sir and i think uh, we can very quickly have the one more round of questions to each of our speakers very quickly to uh, honorable justice patak uh, sir you mentioned about there being a clear conflict and you mentioned about the example of a lady being in an abusive marital relationship wanting to continue in the relationship but but wants the abuse to stop now occasions of this nature uh, the judiciary has to refuse to go blindly by abstract notions and will need to adopt a very realistic and pragmatic approach uh, we are reminded about the saduram bansal uh, matter in the supreme court where uh, despite the petitioners being trespassers the supreme court allowed them to competitively bid for the land therefore what is it that you can think of in terms of breaking um, the conventional norms and how do you really handle distributive and social justice when you come to these tricky issues to be handled so may i request you to unmute yourself oh i'm sorry uh, every state judicial academy i think has the responsibility to inculcate the notion in the judges that they are healers as i have said in my speech also 
my statement is that every judge is a healer if this thought is percolated and every file alphabets of file f i l e and l i f e all these four alphabets are same in file and life so every file with same alphabets contains a life that is the thought i think if is inculcated in a judge then in such type of situation he can handle that is first thing so far as as my lord chief justice has very point rightly pointed out that certain safeguards are also be required to be observed and that safeguard is law itself but the good thing is that within four corners of law if we start doing this thing then it would have a chain reaction first thing second thing that good disposition from the judicial side should be reciprocated by the citizenry by observing Uh, has my lord has raised so this would be symbiotic relationship as i have said earlier that if the citizenry respond positively to the orders passed by the judges and judges pass the orders within four corners of law with sufficient leverage inside it then slowly this would become a movement or slowly uh, this would have a chain reaction but thought should be inculcated right since inception to civil judge class 2 also so that that thought can go or cover last mile coverage to the poor and downtrodden i thank honorable justice uh, pathak for the answer a uh, second question to honorable chief justice karol your lordship there is often a conflict on one hand we have a lot of tribunals that create a alternate and efficacious remedy to a litigant and on the other hand we see a large number of writs filed in the court irrespective of that fact to what extent your lordship a high court must interfere in such matters and and up till what extent it may be a case of sending a litigant from caesar to caesar's wife but really you see uh, you have to see um, uh, tribunalization of justice should or should not be there is a different uh, issue in topic which is debatable but till and so long the legislation is there i think we have to uh, respect them out of due deference we must keep in mind the scope ambit and scope of uh, the uh, two institution or, or the of the powers to be which these two institutions are to exercise uh, yes if it is a case where urgency is a, a case of an extreme intervention of extreme urgency yes there is no doubt about it high courts must do but at the same time we must uh, respect the uh, institutional uh, and uh, the legislative uh, mandate but ultimately see there is only one principle which one has to keep in mind uh, and that is broad substantial justice which is speedy so you have to see really in the, the each case has to be seen in its uh, uh, respective background and uh, the urgency of it i would put it like this that was a very insightful view on the subject you know sir My next question is to Mr. Vikas Singh, sir. There was a recent case of murder of a journalist from one of the cities in Bihar, where a certain politician was also involved. Now, your lordship, it was directly filed and entertained by the Honorable Supreme Court. Your lordship, the Supreme Court in India, as we read from the constitution, it is the highest court of appeal and up till what extent is it justified from handling a sensitive case directly and does it cast a shadow of doubt on the ability of the other courts of the country in handling such a case 
Well, as far as uh, taking up a matter directly is concerned, uh, there is no harm. I don't see any way in any manner it impacting the ultimate outcome of the matter because what the Supreme Court or rather any constitutional court does in a situation of this kind is to ensure that the rule of law is uh, obeyed strictly. So if there is an investigation to be done to ensure that it's an impartial investigation, take it to the stage at which if a charge sheet is to be filed, it should be filed. And while filing that charge sheet, there should be no interference by either the executive or by the polit political bosses. And after that, once the charge sheet is filed, then the court uh, uh, does not interfere in the matter and then leaves it completely to the to the trial court to deal with the matter, uh, uh, you know, ultimately by uh, looking at the evidence which has been collected and whether some culpability can be found or not. So I, the Supreme Court or any constitutional court for that matter ensures that in this uh, jurisdiction of, you know, just uh, ensuring that the rule of law is, um, you know, followed, they do not pass any comment or any observation which may have any impact on the trial. So that a trial, trial ultimately is completely... So if you will recall uh, the very classic Jain Hawala case, Supreme Court uh, said that this is a very serious case. The diaries were found and the diaries were sent to ultimately the police and police filed a charge sheet and the charge sheet was rejected by the trial court as an evidence which is not uh, worthy of any credence. And uh, that judgment of the trial court ultimately stood. So notwithstanding the fact that the Supreme Court said that this case should go to trial and should be properly investigated, the matter ultimately failed. So I don't see any reason why people sh or anybody should have any doubt in the, uh, the uh, interference by the Supreme Court at the initial stage, especially when a case is made out that uh, the, this case is not being properly investigated. Thank you so much for your answer. It does help us to understand the supervisory role of courts and up till what extent can they interfere in an investigation or uh, on a pending investigation before a competent my last question is to the Honorable Justice. Your Lordship, my question in what are the views of the court rule? There was also a judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court recently in Swapnil Tripathi versus Union of India. Not your voice is cracking. Some net connection is glitching. Your Lordship, can you hear me? You are asking to? Uh, Prashant, you can Prashant, you can take it. There is some network glitch. Very well. Uh, this is our last question for the day. We have five more questions which have come from the audience. Unfortunately, I think we we'll have to. I, we, we had, we'll, I think we should close now because yes, uh, yes. we are already one hour behind schedule. We will. <laughs> this is our last question. We don't have any time for any further questions. Uh, our last question is to Honorable Justice Sanjay Karol. Virtual hearing has become a reality. But at the same time, we have a suggestion coming right from the Honorable Supreme Court in Sopnil Tripathi that uh, virtual hearing can be live streaming. Now, do you see live streaming uh, as a means of distributive justice? A very interesting and a very contemporary question. And very, this very short answer. Very short and simple answer. We are having uh, proceedings through this mod. What more do you need? in live streaming. One. Two, every judge reminds himself of the oath which he has taken at the time of joining the office. And that is to uphold the constitution and the constitutional value, values and to discharge the duties without fear, favor, ill will towards so constitution, 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 the answer lies there. We have no fear from anyone, of anyone. That's it. Thank you, Honorable Justice Karol. It is time to close this. Now, With uh, we will resist the temptation to ask more questions. We will resist the temptation to discuss anything more. Uh, we have, it's a very broad topic. This topic was relevant 50 years back. This is relevant today. It would be relevant 50 years from today. But, uh, and therefore we didn't delineate any particular uh, ambit for any of our speakers. And all these speakers have come up with three different dimensions of the topic. Broadly, what we have agreed is that social engineering is a march forward and distributive justice are the requisite breaks that we apply from time to time. 
and the high courts are uh, institutions of highest relevance in this regard because common men mostly find high court as the court of last resort with this we conclude we wholeheartedly thank honorable justice sanjay karol we wholeheartedly thank honorable justice anand patak and we wholeheartedly thank mr vikas singh distinguished senior counsel thank you everybody thank you particularly to you all thank you for, for being with us in this program thank you very much thank you very much Huh?